Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, thank you, Scarlett. Yes, so I'm uh, Kenji Takeda. I've been at Microsoft Research for about uh, a year now. Uh, I was at Southampton University before, uh, actually an aerospace engineer by trade. Um, so if you want to know how to design a Formula One car, uh, come talk to me. Uh, lots of my students do that now for their day job. Um, but I did a lot of work in computing, high performance computing, then cloud computing, uh, scientific computing. So I ended up here. Um, and so I'm in Scarlett's team, uh, having a lot of fun, uh, fantastic people in the lab, fantastic uh, research going on. Uh, so I'm going to give a talk about uh, functional first programming. Okay, so how many of you have done functional programming, Haskell, OCaml, that kind of thing? Okay, a few of you. Oh, quite a lot of you. Cool. How many of you have used F-sharp? Aha, a few of you. Okay, cool. So um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about um, functional programming, okay, and how that fits um, basically in kind of real-world applications, but also in research. Um, what I would say is I used to supervise a lot of PhD students, and I wish I was doing my PhD again because it's a fantastic time in your lives. Uh, basically where, you know, when you're doing your sort of degree undergraduate MSc, you're kind of directed in what you do in terms of you have lectures and assignments and exams and that kind of thing. <clears throat> when you do your PhD, um, you're given a bit of freedom depending on your supervisor, okay? If your supervisor has a whip and kind of cracks it and, you know, so a lot of the projects I, I used to run with companies like Airbus or Formula One team, so they're set deliverables in terms of, you know, you have to do this for the company. Um, but most, that's quite unusual, I think. Most PhDs, you have a fair bit of, of leeway. Um, so what I would say is, you know, if you're, how many of you in your first year are just kind of kicking off? Okay, so a lot of you are just starting out. The first year is a great time for exploration. Okay, you can learn lots of things. There are lots of opportunities like the summer school, <coughs> you know, lots of things that, that you can learn. Um, and so that's kind of how I've, I've kind of pitched this talk. Uh, Don Syme, who is the, the sort of father of F-sharp, um, has given lots of talks about this, and I've sort of combined a few of those um, to try and uh, give you a flavor for what we call functional first programming. Okay, so, uh, you know, functional programming, you know, we can, we, there are definitions of that, um, and there are pure functional languages like Haskell, there are multi paradigm languages like F sharp or like Scala, uh, and so here we're actually talking about functional first, so, so F sharp is that sort of hybrid multi paradigm. Um, and then the most recent um, developments uh, in F-sharp are around this information-rich programming. So I'll get onto that in the second half of the talk in terms of how F-sharp with its new version, which is just um, sort of shipping in, in release candidate now um, and shipping later in the year, um, allows us to really tap into particularly sort of information on the web. Um, so hopefully you can kind of look at this with an open mind um, and... Uh, I will plug is that Thomas Petracek here, who's, who's one of our PhD students, who happens to also be uh, a Microsoft MVP. So we have these people called MVPs, Most Valuable Professionals. Um, and he's also as a PhD, first year, right? Second year, okay. So he has written a book on F Sharp as well. He gives training to people, for instance, in the city of London. Uh, he was just in New York giving a training course to people in the like New York Stock Exchange type people, banks, uh, on using F Sharp. So, um, so Thomas uh, is giving a tutorial on F Sharp tomorrow at five o'clock. Okay, um, so you know if you want to know more and particularly kind of do technical deep dive, um, then please do come along. Uh, you know it's great. We ran a, a, an F Sharp workshop at the University of Pisa just last week with 100 people, uh, about 50 uh, students, and, and that was great fun as well. So, um, so a lot of technical deep dive really tomorrow with Thomas. And I, but I'm trying to just give you a bit of a flavour, uh, mainly to get you to go to the tutorial, quite frankly. Um, <laughs> Um, but also to explore this. So, <clears throat> so when we think about writing software, okay, so, so how many of you are doing kind of computer science software? Oh, computer science PhD, you know, pretty hardcore, formal methods, verification, that kind of thing, so a few of you, okay. How many of you are doing more applied stuff, maybe like biology, environmental science, something like that, okay. How many of you are doing something in between? All right, how many of you don't know what you're doing yet? <laughs> okay, me, right, okay. So, but, you know, you've, you've all kind of, I guess, written some software at some point in your lives. <clears throat> and there, there are problems with software, right? One of the things is typically we don't just write software for the fun of it. Some people do. Hands up who write software for the fun of it. Okay, some people do, which is really cool. Okay. 
Hands up who writes software to actually kind of do a particular task, get some results, do something. Okay, so that's most of you. Okay. So typically when we think about software development, we're trying to get something done. We're trying to do something. In a business sense, this is called time to market. Okay, so if you're a, a, a company, okay, so say you're a startup and you're trying to get into the marketplace, you want to get into the marketplace as quickly as possible so some, some other person doesn't beat you to it. So typically we would call that time to market. Here I've called it getting things done in a more research sense. <clears throat> the other thing is efficiency. So when I run my code, typically I want it to run fast, right? Typically I want it to run infinitely fast, so I just get the answer like that. Sometimes that's not possible. So efficiency, speed of execution is, is, is clearly important. Correctness is important, okay? So this is kind of, people don't always think of this, but it kind of, if you don't have this, the first two things don't happen. Right? If you have bugs in your code, okay, you're not getting your stuff done. You can run the code, okay, so I could run the code really, really fast, but if I get the wrong answer, that's not particularly useful. So correctness is actually vitally important. Okay? And if I don't have correctness at the outset when I initially write my code, that just means I have to do a lot of debugging. Okay? Complexity is an interesting one. So if I am trying to build a model for something, uh, often I want to build in as many features as I can into that model, and that model gets more and more complex. And so in, in whatever software language, for instance, that I'm using, I want to be able to capture complexity in an easy way that I can understand as a human being, okay, so I can translate into software. So these are four things that are vitally important for any software. Okay. So... If I boil that down, what's the need? So developers, software developers, programmers, okay. What you really want to be doing is developing correct software, okay. So software that gives the right answer, okay. That's a good start. I want efficient software so that I get the answer quickly, okay. And I want to be able to deliver that software on time, okay. So I actually want to be able to uh, deliver my finished software. So if I'm doing my PhD, typically when I do my PhD, I spend about a year trying to get this correctness stuff done, okay, because I was translating um, software from a language called OCAM, okay, which is a parallel computing language into C uh, plus MPI message processing interface. It took me about a year to do that because it was horrendously complicated, or it was all asynchronous and horrible. Um, so I kept running it and having to run all these debugs and things. So correct code, but on time is kind of actually getting results. So it took me like a year before I actually had any results, okay, which was immensely frustrating. I wasn't using F sharp, I was using OCAM and C. F sharp attempts as a language and a paradigm to deliver that in a very elegant way. <coughs> Not just F sharp though. So functional languages, functional first languages, by design, okay, will generate simple, correct, and robust code. Okay. So typically in a functional language, okay, we have functions. Um, we have values which are immutable, so I can't change them. So in a function, I can have lots of inputs go into the function, and I get one output. Okay? But I don't change things outside of the function. So I can unit test the function. Once I've written the function, and I've tested inputs give me these outputs, that's it, done. It will always work. The order in which I call that function in relation to other functions doesn't break it. Okay? In imperative languages like C Sharp or Java, okay, I have to do this testing regime, and if I flip the order of execution, I could actually break the function. Okay. So that's where functional languages, and again, yeah, all functional languages uh, uh, do this. Okay. So this is kind of just at the core of, of, of a functional language. F sharp's interesting as an interoperable language. So F sharp is, is part of the .NET family of languages. So how many of you use .NET, C sharp, that kind of thing? Okay. So F sharp is a .NET language. So from F sharp, I can call C sharp, and from C sharp, I can call F sharp. Okay, and I get the full stack going up and down, errors, etc. What that means is I can sort of seamlessly build a piece of F-sharp code into my solution. So if I have a million lines of uh, C-sharp code to do all sorts of fancy stuff, um, often it's things like UI and that kind of thing. If I need to do, for instance, some core mathematics or some core kind of pulling stuff from the web, I can write a component in F-sharp and I can bed that in my C-sharp code and seamlessly uh, talk to it. Uh, and so what that means is if I have a large solution, so if typically in F-sharp it's used in big investment banks, they have huge you know, trading floor software and things like that. The F-sharp's really good at certain things, and they can just slide that in. And so an interoperable language, and not all functional languages are as interoperable as 
uh, F sharp. Uh, you know, this is pretty cool. If I have an interoperable language, it also means that I can eliminate an entire phase of development. So, some, so R, how many people use R? Okay, so R is like statistical uh, language package, okay. So a lot of companies, typically, or researchers, you write some R code, R is, is really cool. It's single thread in 32-bit, okay. Um, uh, not super fast at everything. Um, so what can often happen is R is really good for prototyping ideas and stats and things like that. But when I actually say I, I write some R code and I want to run like a million instances of that, right, if the fact that that's a bit slow can affect, you know, when I get my results, okay. Um, so what typically can happen is, uh, for instance, in a bank, they would take R code and they'd get a team of developers to convert it into C sharp. Okay, and that might take a couple of months. Okay. Similarly, Mathematica. How many of you use Mathematica? Yeah, a few of you. Very good um, uh, you know, mathematical piece of software. And again, you don't really want to run that in production. So I spoke to one bank and they said, well, you know, our quants write in Mathematica and then we need to deploy onto 100,000 machines. Okay, that's a lot of licensing costs for Mathematica. So what they do is they actually convert it to C++. Again, they said that takes about three months. Okay. With F Sharp, what's interesting is F Sharp has in nice characteristics in terms of being able to program uh, stats and maths. Um, but when you compile it, you've immediately got .NET code that runs fast. Okay. In fact, it's comparable to C Sharp and Java. Okay. Sometimes it can go as fast as C++, depending how the compiler can actually... Uh, streamline that code, okay. Um, so efficiency here is, is really important. And what it means as well is that the functional languages and the way we think about decomposing a problem into function, it's quite mathematical, okay. Mathematicians think functionally. And therefore, I can tackle and decompose a complex problem. I used to teach first year computing to engineers who some of them never touched a computer before. Okay, well, now typically they use Word and PowerPoint. How do you then teach them how to solve partial differential equations using a finite difference method on a computer, right? It's quite a big step. Um, and a lot of it is actually translating mathematics into computer code into a number of statements. Whereas functional programming is much more about how do I translate a mathematical function into a computational function, and it's a much more seamless transition, okay? So functional first thinking, okay? plug for Thomas's book, Real World Functional Programming, is kind of interesting in terms of it. It teaches functional programming, but also with C-sharp examples as well as F-sharp. Um, has some nice features, okay? So think, so I would encourage you as people starting out to at least look at functional programming, okay? We have this F-sharp tutorial tomorrow to expose you to that, but other things, so Simon Payne Jones uh, is giving a couple of talks, and of course Haskell, the Glasgow Haskell compiler is essentially comes out of this lab as well. So again, yeah, think about functional programming. Yeah? You're saying F sharp is really efficient. So um, would you say F sharp has many more abstractions than C sharp? Many more? Abstractions. How do you mean? Uh, like lambda expressions. Or yeah, 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 it's full, yeah, it's all lambda calculus. Yeah. Yeah, and actually some of the things in C sharp have come from F sharp. So generics, for instance, .NET generics have come out of C sharp. I'll show you some examples of async. Parallel have come out of F sharp. Some people say if you want to see what C sharp looks like in three years, look at F sharp today. Okay. Um, it's interesting in terms of tech transfer. I was chatting to Don uh, just, just the other day saying what's interesting is, you know, Don has an idea or people have an idea about F sharp. We can get it into F sharp and push it through into it suddenly appears into F sharp product and then people sort of get visibility of it. So, so it's kind of interesting. Like I say, I'll show you the stuff on information rich pro, uh, programming and type providers. And uh, yeah, a lot of people are like, oh, that'd be really cool in C sharp. So, um, so yeah, yeah, <laughs> keep going. Well, my question is that, so you see, I think the CLR was designed around C sharp, and C sharp was designed around CLR, so it runs very efficiently. But F sharp came a long time later. So, how come F sharp can run as efficiently as C sharp? Because it wasn't really designed. It all gets compiled down into the same intermediate language bytecode, right? Sure. And so. I mean, yeah, the, the sort of one of the things with F sharp was interesting is, you know, making it a .NET language. So it, it was designed from the ground up as a .NET language. Okay, so, so you know, F sharp came along after .NET. So, um, so in the design of the language, uh, you know, uh, Don could make sure and, and the people on the team could make sure that it all meshed together really nicely. Um, 
Whereas, you know, if you took a, a, a functional language that came before .NET, then, you, you know, you get a bit more of an impedance mismatch. Um, so that's why the sort of timing around this is, is, is I guess that's right, Thomas? Yeah. Yeah. I guess for the, for the performance, um, if you use some functional abstraction in F sharp, then you would have to use some other OO abstraction in C sharp to write the code. And often the, the thing that F sharp does when it compiles some functional construct is that it generates something that you would write by hand as an object-oriented abstraction. So often the code is quite similar at the IL compiled level. Yeah. There's no overhead. Well, there's, there's definitely some overhead with certain features. Um, but it means you can solve the problem with five lines instead of 100. So. Yeah. But then. Yeah, sometimes you have to you have to maybe switch to the imperative style in F sharp, but that's usually more like optimization at the end of the development. So I think this is where this interoperability is interesting. It's not like if you were using a, a functional language which was not interoperable, you have to make a hard choice and say, I can only use this language. With F sharp, you can kind of mix and match. Even you know, with VB, you could do a mixed solution, some stuff in VB, because VB is good at that, and F sharp is good at that. So that's why I think, you know, don't think of F sharp as like, oh, I need to just you know, switch everything to F sharp. It should just be another part of your toolkit. Okay? And you, you know, some things will be beautiful in F sharp, and some things just make more sense in C sharp. But if you actually have knowledge of both, you can kind of mix and match, and that can make you much more productive in kind of whatever you're doing. So does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, sure. I mean, like I said, you know, this is about thinking functionally. So whatever, uh, you know, talk to, to Simon, you know, about Haskell. You know, we love Haskell in the lab because obviously that's why we kind of still push out the, the GHC. So, so I think that's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sort of focusing on F sharp a little bit here. But, um, you know, the, I think the thing is like, I don't know if you find this, but, you know, functional programming just makes you productive, right, in whichever one. You know, Scala is much more sort of built on the Java stack, okay, but it's a bit more OO than, than, than functional in, in its design, so. Okay. So what is F sharp? So it is a functional first language, okay. It's open source, okay. So you can download it. Thomas has done some work where he's taken the open source compiler and done some research on top of it. So as a research language, um, you can actually um, download it and modify it, okay. So it's, it's pretty interesting. I'm sorry. Yep. Can I, can I just say something here? Because you have uh, heard uh, Thomas um, making comments about F sharp. And actually, Thomas is one of the attendants at the summer school, but he's also working with us uh, on the F Sharp project. And he will give a, a tutorial on Friday evening on F Sharp. Oh, so Wednesday evening. Oh, Wednesday evening. Yeah, tomorrow. So, yeah. Uh, tomorrow evening um, on F Sharp, so you have the opportunity to learn more and yeah. um, ask him very detailed questions. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so, as with many. Um, Functional languages, here's a, is an example of just if I'm commanding, say, a Mars rover, and here's how I might write it. You could probably write it more elegantly uh, in C sharp, um, but you can see F sharp's quite nice. It uses white space uh, instead of braces, for instance, so we can make quite clean code. Um, again, functional data, so if I've got, we have tuples, okay, and so this is using the .NET generics in C sharp for a fully generic tuple, but you can see how, you know, the F sharp can, can be quite an elegant way of writing code. There are some trends in software, okay? The web, the internet, this thing, this, I don't know if it's a fad, but it's, I guess, going to stick around for a while. Multi-core parallel programming, okay? I, my PhD was in parallel programming. You know, basically, it's a nightmare, right? So parallel programming, multi-core. You know, as I was at a conference last week, uh, high performance computing with all the people who basically own the biggest computers in the world. So the, the biggest computer in the world now is in the US, and it has, guess how many cores it has? Just shoot. 100,000, any, pardon? One Keep going. <laughs> 1.5 million cores, okay. Uh, 16 petaflops, okay, US machine. Uh, actually, interesting at the, at, the, at the conference, they were talking about exascale. Okay, so it's 1,000 petaflops, we estimate by 2018, 2019, okay. It was interesting talking about that in terms of just What's the mean time to failure of memory, okay, if you have a machine with that many cores and you have that much RAM, 
Okay, <laughs> memory fails, right? There's a mean time to failure for a memory chip. If you have that many, if you're running your code, you're pretty much guaranteed to have a memory failure. How do you, so how do you code to that? Yeah, how do you do fault tolerance? Okay, so it's, it's, it's kind of interesting. So this whole multi-core going from, you know, you know, laptops now shipping with quad-core phones, you know, if it's like a shipping quad-core, right? Um, uh, and then data, okay. So S Sharp has async, which is pretty cool. So I can do grab some web pages, and then I can just run that asynchronously, so, so it pulls through. Um, again, parallel CPU, I can do this loop, compute these tasks, and I can say run asynchronously, and bang, it's just doing it in a couple of lines of code. Okay, so there's some quite nice features there. This is really cool, units of measure. Okay, so units are important. Okay, uh, so I'm an aerospace engineer, and what's interesting is to teach students, we used to set exam questions in imperial units. Okay, feet, slugs, that kind of thing. Because if you work in the US on any aerospace project, you're going to use feet, inches, slugs, etc. Okay, the US uses imperial units for everything not meters, okay? Luckily, they still use hours, minutes, and seconds, but, you know, probably not by choice. So, just units are important, okay? So, SDI was this uh, Ronald Reagan experiment to basically build a huge laser, star it was what's called Star Wars, a laser that could shoot down missiles, okay, nuclear missiles. So, the experimental plan was stick a big laser on a big mountain in Hawaii, track the space shuttle, Okay, and see if we can use the laser to hit the space shuttle. It had a little mirror on the bottom of it. So that was the plan. What actually happened was they stuck the laser up there and they programmed the autopilot on the space shuttle and this happened. Okay, and it didn't work. And this is the reason. Okay, so basically they sent up instructions to the space shuttle and said, okay, uh, make sure that the mirror is uh, pointing downward uh, to spot 10,000 feet above sea level um, when actually the guidance system was expecting it in nautical miles. And so rather than pointing the mirror down ten to the point 10,000 feet, it was pointing the mirror to a point 10,000 nautical miles above the Earth, and so it flipped the space shuttle or over. They eventually fixed it. But the issue was, in fact, they just used the wrong units, okay? The computer was expecting units of nautical miles. The people programmed it thinking it was in feet, okay? Another example, NASA lost, lost a Mars orbiter, again, because some people were using SI units and some people were using Imperial units, okay? So it's a bit embarrassing when you lose $125 million uh, spacecraft, okay? So what's this got to do with uh, F-sharp? So F-sharp has units. So we can assign a unit to a variable, and then the software can then verify that all of the units are consistent. Okay. And so this is, for instance, why if you're a bank, you can have currencies. Okay. And so this is kind of built into the compiler, built into the system. And this is something that people really, really like. Okay. So units of measure is, is pretty cool. Uh, this is the paper, if you want to actually read Andrew Kennedy upstairs. Uh, did the work on this in terms of, okay, well, how do we build units of measure into a programming language? Okay, so there was some real research from the lab that's gone through into the product, as Ken was saying, as a tech transfer into the product, and now, for instance, you know, um, lots of people using units of measure, particularly sort of banks really like it. I mean, you know, we're dealing with lots of different currencies, for instance, you know, you want to be able to verify that software, so. So, yeah. Is the set of available uh, measures <coughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, you can put your own. So it ships, I think, with SI units um, as a standard library, and then, yeah, you can extend it with whatever you want. So you can define a, 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 a value, and then you can assign units to it, and you can assign different units. So like, say, banks will typically assign all different currencies, for instance, to different units. Um, so you can imagine if you're doing calculations, you're writing some complex code um, for stock markets and that type of thing, or you know, particularly foreign exchange, commodities, you, know, you want to make sure you're getting the currencies right and you don't have some error in your algorithm where you know, it's actually flipping units and you don't know. So, so it's, um, yeah. So some examples of where people have used particularly F-sharp. PowerGen uh, essentially is a company that um, controls a lot of the UK electricity grid. Okay. And so they, had a, they needed to do load balancing across the, the UK national grid. 
And what's interesting is Simon Cousins here is they, um, you know, it's quite a complex project. They rolled out the software um, and he waited a week and he didn't get any phone calls, didn't get any bug reports. So he got on the phone to all the people around the country and said, you didn't install my software, did you? You didn't roll out the update? And they said, no, we did. There just weren't any bugs. Okay. <laughs> so it shows how, you know, doing um, uh, sort of lack of bugs, okay? So there's type checkers, for instance, the unit testing, okay? The other interesting thing is exploratory programming. So you'll see this actually in Try Sharp. It's this interactive console. So it's a REPL console, so I can type something, run the command, see what comes out, and I can very quickly experiment. Okay, so that's built into F Sharp uh, in Visual Studio, it's called F Sharp Interactive, and also in the Try F Sharp console. So that's quite nice. Again, units of measure just got rid of a whole class of errors that they were previously seeing. Um, parallelism. So it just shows how you know it's really helped these folks. And again, how many of you use Python? Yeah. So again, this company is a biotech company doing genome stuff. And you know, they just thought, you know, they've switched to F sharp now. It's quicker to develop, quicker to run. They really like it. Um, again, the units of measure just meant they could find a bug really quickly. So again, yeah, F sharp's not the only solution in the world, but here you can see where it's, um, some people have found it quite useful. Okay. Um, F sharp's used, yeah. Python, yeah. Python is faster than Java. Uh, depends what you're doing. Depends what libraries you're using, right? If you're using a math library, the Intel Math Kernel library, then you're pretty much going at the machine speed anyway. Um, so you can do that in F Sharp as well, and you can use the Intel Math Kernel library. And so, so it does depend. For this application, which these guys were using, OK, well, the that's the what they saw. I mean, it's. it's Um, so the, this, is, this is their business, right? These guys uh, have a company and they're using Python to make money and they switch. So it's for their problem, right? So yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's a case study, right? It's their problem. They were doing stuff in Python. It ran this fast for whatever it was, pipeline for doing genome resequencing, okay? So you could argue that maybe these guys weren't writing their Python code as fast, but these guys were in it to make money, so I'm assuming that they actually had some smart people who were trying to do the job, <laughs> you know, the best job they could. Okay, so, so yeah, so. Uh, the development time, though, as well, is something that, you know, obviously some features in there. And again, you know, this kind of thing, you know, you can spend a week chasing a bug, right? So, you know, so different things in here. But, uh, uh, again, this is, you know, this is real world. This is not a theoretical experiment. These guys are in business, right? So these guys, this bottom line helps them make more money. And that's, that's this case study, okay? So these are, we have multiple case studies, lots of different case studies where people have used it. And again, not just F-sharp, you know, other people are finding functional programming is kind of on the rise now in terms of people are finding that this functional programming, particularly um, for development and robust code is, is a good thing. Okay, so yeah, I used to teach Python. Python's awesome, right? Another thing, Python, get it in Visual Studio, bang. So, um, but, uh, but yeah, again, it's, it's an example, right? So a lot of it comes down to libraries and what libraries you're using. And like say, there's good code and bad code, right? I'm assuming that these guys write good code because <laughs> I don't know these guys, but it's a company, right? If they were writing bad code, they'd be out of business. So this <laughs> is my assumption. So, does that make sense? You don't believe me, do you? <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's, it's comparing um, if you use like NumPy in Python, then it's running at the machine, machine speed, and then you can't go faster. But if you write some like sequence processing in Python by hand, uh, you do lots of boxing of values, like it's, it's passing everything as a reference. Yeah, yeah. No, then in that, yeah, in that yeah. case, like writing your own complex algorithms in Python is probably going to be slower. But usually you can express everything with NumPy, and then it's just as fast as any other language. Yeah. So I, th I think the key thing here is really, uh, and I think for you as PhD students, is I mean, often 
you use the language that your supervisor tells you to use, right? Because certainly I, as a supervisor, would maybe feel a bit uncomfortable if my student was writing stuff that I couldn't read. <laughs> Okay, so there is this kind of passing down of you. So in the department I was in, in aerospace, probably 80% of the code was in Fortran. Okay, Fortran 77, Fortran 90, okay. And this was code that we shipped to Airbus for designing airplanes, right? So, so, so often you use whatever code you're, you're told to use. What I would say here is, particularly as early pages, you should just have a, a, a toolkit with lots of things in. Okay, certainly Python should be a piece of that toolkit, you know, Java, .NET, you know, you should, you should be able to use anything and you should be able to make the choice of what the best tool is for the job. But if you don't have experience of the wide tool set and only, you know, I'm using a hammer when I should be using a screwdriver thing, yeah, so, so again, you know, and if you're doing this, actually what you should do is just do the benchmark, right? Pull out a kernel of what's taken all the time, see what, what works best, right? So, good question. In the lab here, uh, we have a team that actually works uh, for, for Bing, okay, and does the ad ranking, okay, so this helps with the auctioning of ads, okay, uh, and so most of their code is actually written in um, F-sharp, okay, and again, they just find it useful for prototyping, okay, it's a nice language for that, but again, the units of measure comes into this as well, so again, it's just... Another example of where, um, you know, this kind of functional approach um, kind of works really nicely. Okay, so that's kind of uh, where this functional first thinking, think of it as functional first thinking, where F-sharp is an instantiation of that, and there are other instantiations which, you know, may be more or less appropriate. Okay. So you talked about speed, so F-core math, for instance, is a GPU library for F-sharp, so I just write some F-sharp code and bang, run it on GPU. Um, so there are lots of different ways, again, you can use F-sharp as part of that toolkit for any particular solution that you're, that you're using. Okay. I'm going to talk about F-sharp 3 now, just uh, to end up on sort of data integration, which we're really super excited about. And then how many of you heard of Azure? Right, a few of you. So how many of you heard of cloud computing? How many of you have heard of Amazon Web Services? How many of you heard as Google Cloud? All right, that was a, that was a, they announced some stuff uh, last week. Um, so Azure is our cloud thing, okay? Um, and F Sharp um, plays quite nicely with that, okay? Because you know, with Microsoft Stack, we try and make sure that things work well together. Um, and so again, you can you can you can uh, do a lot of great things, uh, a lot of great things with that. And this is some stuff we're actively doing in the lab. So. Hopefully that's a kind of quick canter through around some things around functional thinking, functional programming, and how you know, F-sharp is, is one way you can do that. So I want to go on to now this new line of thinking um, with F-sharp, which is this information-rich programming. So the fundamental kind of observation is we now live in an information society, okay? So in the old days, okay, when we were cavemen and cave women. What we'd do is we would grab a spear, we'd go out, we'd go and hunt, okay, we'd grab an animal, we'd go home and feed the family, okay. Then this agricultural revolution came along, we discovered how to domesticate animals, how to farm, how to grow crops, okay. And so we moved from this hunter-gatherer society into this agricultural society, okay. Then, okay, we could essentially uh, make that really, really easy to do, and we came up with this idea of making machines, okay. So we could build things, and we could build you know, furniture and houses and cars and airplanes, okay? So that was this industrial revolution, okay? So we, we basically moved to making stuff, okay? And so more recently, we're kind of in the middle of this information revolution, where particularly the web has broken open information, okay? So the printing press famously uh, made knowledge much more widely available, okay? Previously, people would have to handwrite books and they'd be distributed, so like monks in monasteries would distribute Bibles, for instance. The printing press kind of productionized that so we could have newspapers and things, so we could disseminate information very quickly, okay? So that was kind of the start of the information revolution. Now, electronically, we can immediately, instantly disseminate information, okay? So this is creating this new revolution um, of, you know, shrinking the world, uh, making information very uh, readily available. So it's kind of, we're, we're, it's a very, very interesting, exciting time to be alive. 
One could argue that programming languages were not designed for that. They were designed for an industrial age. Okay. Um, and so languages from the ground up were not really designed to integrate information at its core as sort of first-class citizen. Okay, information in the sort of internet web sense. Okay. And so if we want to program against that, you know, people have come up with ways of doing that. Okay, JSON and stuff like that. But again, we have this friction, okay, accessing information. You have to go through all these APIs and interfaces. And, uh, and when I'm actually coding, I can't just pull stuff in to the language, okay. So this is a major, major problem as we, we, we're in this information revolution. And more and more of the software we write and web apps, phone apps, you know, tablet apps, etc., need to integrate this information. Okay? And it's a big, big problem. Okay? And we can solve the problem using the existing toolkit, okay? which again, one could argue, was designed for a different age. Or we could look at, OK, well, how do we change our language design in order to you know, really play well in this sort of sea of information. And that's where you know, the work that Don's been doing and the F-Sharp team has been trying to just experiment and say, OK, how might we do that? And so the solution today that they sort of come up with uh, is what we call type providers. And you, know, you could have done this other languages, but the reason that we use F-Sharp is because we have control of languages, of the language. We have type inference, OK? We have strong typing. We have good tooling, Visual Studio. We have the interop. Okay, uh, we have things like link. So this is so type providers is the again an experiment really in how do we um, you know think about language design in, in an information rich society. And what a type provider does is at compile time it basically can go into an information space, pull back the schema and the metadata for that information space and make it available to the developer right at the, in the IDE. Okay. The data, the information is not pulled in, okay, but it's a pipe where we can suck, suck all those data and services in to the language itself. So it doesn't contain the data, it's extensible so you can write your own type provider. There are some that ship out of the box. Okay. So an example of this is the World Bank. So the World Bank publishes a whole bunch of data. Okay? It's great. There's this big revolution in open data. Okay? Governments are pushing out more and more of their data. Okay? In, the gov in the UK, there's opendata.gov.uk. In the US, in Australia, Brazil. Okay? There's a push for transparency, pushing data out. Okay? Uh, so you can go to the World Bank website, and there's lots of these different indicators, okay, and, you can, and there's an API for that, and you can look through documentation, and you can access all of those APIs. Now, the type provider mechanism, and this is an example, and the type provider is actually Thomas's piece of work, uh, is what I can do is I can uh, activate the type provider in a DLL, okay, and then once I've activated it, what I do is I just uh, access World Bank dot. And what this is pulling the schema back from the World Bank website and pushing it straight into IntelliSense inside Visual Studio. Oops, hang on. Don't want to do that. I want it to continue playing. OK. And then, so I do that. So I say, OK, well, I want to now drill down and explore this information space. So I do World Bank. I do dot. I go, oh, this is interesting. So I have countries. So I go, OK, dot. So I do dot. And it's now pulled back the list of countries from the World Bank site. And I can browse through that information space. And I can go dot. And I can now, this is really interesting, say, wow, OK, so I now have access to hundreds of different data sets in there, OK? And what's interesting is it's pulling back the metadata. So clearly, this is all available in some documentation somewhere. But here, I don't have to do that. I just do dot, bang, it's in Visual Studio. OK, so I can, uh, there we go. So I can explore the information space. OK, so what that means is it makes it much nicer for me as a developer to go through and actually pull back this data. OK, so the type provider, again, is, enables me to pull that back. In previously, to do that, I'd have to do some code gen. It'll be quite static. And, uh, and here, it's trying to make that really seamless. OK, and so here, we're going to just pull back uh, the Greek national debt. OK as a percentage of its GDP. Okay, and you can see it's like 140% of its GDP. 
Uh, so that's one set of data. But now what's interesting is now I can just, now I know that I can say, well, I want to compare that with some other countries. So I can go and pull back some other countries uh, and then immediately just hit, you know, uh, this is just some formatting for the chart. Hit bang and it's going to the World Bank and it's pulling back all that data, okay, through the API. And you can see why Greece is in trouble um, because its national debt is quite a lot worse than other countries. But hopefully you can see there how the type provider mechanism allows me to pull back the data like over the web. Okay. Another example here is with some uh, climate data. Um, so there's a, there's a file format called NetCDF, which is a binary format where pretty much all climate data and weather data is, is people distribute it. Okay, so it's a very compact binary format. Because it's a binary format, it's a little bit opaque. Um, so we've built a type provider that allows me to pull that NetCDF in. Uh, this is firing up just a tool called uh, Dataset Viewer. So this is a visualization tool. So I'm pulling in this data set, and so I can do CRU dot. And then again, it's pulling together the schema. It's giving me lot and lat, lat and long, and monthly data, etc. Um, and then I can immediately pull that back, and you'll see then it uh, it plots uh, an area of the UK uh, with some temperature data, basically. So I'm going to pull that through and do the visualization uh, into the dataset viewer. Uh, and you can see here it shows you a contour map then of the uh, monthly average temperature in the UK from this big, chunky, nasty binary data file, okay? And you can see the schema comes up there. So that's interesting. The other thing is Microsoft has this thing called the Azure Data Marketplace. So on the cloud, you can go to the Data Marketplace, and there are hundreds of different data sets up there. It's essentially an area where you can share data, okay? The UK Met Office, so where Scarlett's weather forecast came from, publishes its five-day forecast on three-hour intervals every three hours on that website. And so here what we're using is the Azure Data Marketplace type provider. And we're going out to there and we're pulling back now um, essentially the weather forecast for weather stations around the UK. And then we're actually applying a little bit of uh, processing on that to compare that with the 50-year average for that point. Okay, and this is the delta between what's the average over 50 years at each one of these points. And you'll see the dots coming up as it's pulling the data through from the Azure Data Marketplace. So that's essentially the, the weather forecast data. So it shows how we can use the type provider mechanism to pull data from different places and then just be able to do some different uh, mathematics around that. So hopefully that shows you why this type provider mechanism or how it kind of makes that really nicely smooth. Why is that important? Because of this. If you go to a programmable web, it shows you all the open APIs available over the web, okay, from sort of 2000. Okay, and what's interesting is if you plot the numbers, is it's pretty exponential. Okay, so what it means is this ability to pull information from the web into the language right to the developer's fingertips is becoming more and more and more important. Okay, and that's where this experiment with F Sharp is taking us is, you know, can we really make that, you know, reality? So lots of different applications for type providers, okay. We've done a type provider for an Excel spreadsheet, for instance, so you can pull spreadsheet data in. Um, social data, there's a great demo on the web if you go and see it. If you do a search on like Don Syme, S-Y-M-E, type provider, great Twitter example where you can just pull the live Twitter stream through and then apply, use F-sharp to apply filters in real time against it. So lots of different uh, examples. Again, it's extensible, it's open, you can write your own type providers. So I just want to finish up in terms of Functional first thinking, so not just F-sharp, okay? So OCaml, Haskell, Scala, et cetera. It's really nice paradigm, something you, I, you know, encourage you to explore in whichever language you're most comfortable with. And again, we've got a tutorial tomorrow if you want to play around with F-sharp. And again, you know, when you go out for jobs afterwards, you know, again, this functional programming is becoming more and more prevalent as systems become more complex, software systems become more complex, okay? And so F-sharp itself, just in summary, um, you know, has some nice features, but again, we're focusing on the future, which is web, data, and cloud. So tutorial session, try F-sharp is where you can actually learn F-sharp, and that's what Thomas will be using tomorrow. F-sharp.net is the main Microsoft F-sharp website. So thank you very much.
sorry, I'm a, I'm a bit sick. Um, <laughs> you've, uh, you've spoken a lot about the correctness of F Sharp. Um, in my experience in commercial development, um, memory managed systems dealt with a lot of the problems that people had with managing memory. Mm -hmm. um, but most of the bugs that we found were from locking um, and from mutexes and getting those things wrong. Um, whereas all of the examples of parallelism that you've so far shown have been embarrassingly parallel where you don't actually have to worry about locking or any of those sorts of things. So I was just wondering, does F-Sharp provide anything above and beyond that other languages or other tools don't with regards to getting locking and parallelism that's not embarrassing par embarrassingly parallel um, correct? So here I was talking about the sort of async mechanism, like you say, which is slightly different to um, what you were talking about. Um, so I guess in terms of uh, correctness and locking, um, I guess when you're doing locking, you're just trying to make sure things don't interfere with each other, right? As, as variables pass through in, in, in out of order or a different order. And so I guess the functional paradigm just helps because those functions don't change variables outside. So you can architect your solution uh, in a, you can sort of think about how to uh, architect that parallel solution in a more robust way. So you still have to think hard about how do I actually make this work in order? Is that yeah, a fair assumption? Yeah, I guess at the like, technical level, you have a few options. There's um, the task yeah. parallel. Oops, just broke it. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. So there's um, something which is in .NET which is called task parallel library which is um, like task-based uh, library for doing parallel programming, which is kind of similar to the Haskell par monad, if you're familiar with that. So that's the, the like one functional way. Um, then there's something based on the actor or agent-based model, which is like Erlang-based programming model based on message passing. Um, so that's another option. And you can also use locking if you're really sure that that's what you want to do. Um, in the industry, I guess most of the case studies that Kenji mentioned, like the Eon data processing, they were building on the actor model based on message passing, which is, I, I find it personally easier model to work with. Um, and it's getting quite popular in languages like Erlang and Scala. But you have, you have choice of different options, which I guess relates to the fact that you can interoperate with .NET, which has some libraries, and with some F-sharp specific things as well. Yeah, so it's not a magic bullet. Um, I think one of the things that if your code is easier to read, then you can kind of assemble, more, assemble the solution in a clearer way. It helps you think through the problem. I think, so parallel programming is still hard. And again, the task parallel library is an attempt by Microsoft to make it easier, uh, but it's at the .NET level, so you have access to that. Right. So it's, I uh, guess yeah, it's a tough the point problem. that I'm trying to make is that most bugs that we've found were due to uh, parallelism bugs uh, getting locking right, uh, where there's some sort of shared state that multiple processes need access to, and getting those things right uh, actually was the source of most of our bugs. Um, so with regards to robustness, the language doesn't seem to provide some kind of uh, solution to that problem. Uh, not that I'm suggesting that there necessarily is one, but that yeah. that, that, that was the main problem that we we faced with regard to with code robustness. Yeah, I mean shared states was yeah tough to manage, but again, I think here there is a set of tools that that maybe make it easier to see how to manage that state. Um, but yeah, like I said parallel programming was still <laughs> still a tough. I guess one. It, it gives you more programming models, so you can choose one that doesn't rely that heavily on locks and shared state, and then it's easier to deal with it. Sure. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Yes. Okay. Thank you, first of all, for the great presentation. Thank you. And um, uh, I have a question about the today question, yeah? Each of us has different operation systems. Some of us has Microsoft Windows, other has Linux mm -hmm. and Mac OS. Uh, what about F Sharp? Will it work on different operation systems or it is only logged for Windows? So <clears throat> F-sharp ships with Visual Studio, which runs on Windows, um, but it, the open source drop runs on Linux uh, and Mac OS as well. So, so if you're not using use Linux or Mac, then maybe not, but <laughs> you know, hopefully we have all the bases covered. Um, so the open source drop 
um, actually has that, right? So there's a Linux compiler, um, and uh, I think it works with Mono Develop, right? So it works with Mono Develop as well. And what so about mobile devices? Is it also? Uh, so you can program uh, you can program Windows phones, I think, um, but I'm not sure. So it's uh, you can use it with XNA, okay? So you can program Xbox, uh, and you can program Windows Phone with it as well. Uh, for non Microsoft operating systems, I'm not too sure. So okay, thank you. Okay. okay. There's, there's the trend to write mobile applications in JavaScript, and. Uh, there are a few projects that translate F# -sharp to JavaScript, so you can write code in F# -sharp and then it will run everywhere. But that's still in kind of early slash research phase. So it's an it's an interesting direction. Okay. Yeah. So that's this. Oh, oh you yeah, switched over. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. A related question to that. Um, so you talk about an open source drop. Is that a one-time only thing, or are you going to try and build a bit of more of a community around? Uh, no, um, we're committed to open source drops. So F# -sharp 3.0 will also be with the type providers, part of the open source drop, and it's on GitHub, right? Yes, it's on GitHub. So. By the way, one one quick comment. I know it's complicated. Right? When you ask questions, you just speak into the phone, and of course to the speaker, but also make sure that the rest of the audience can follow what, what <laughs> you're saying, so that um, we can all follow follow the discussion. But, um, yeah, good question. So. Um, Oh, well, thank you very much, and I uh, hope you enjoy the week. Cheers.